It was All-Ireland Hurling Quarter Final Day at Semple Stadium on Saturday. It finished Clare 124, Wexford 314 and Galway 219, Cork 121. So it's going to be Galway against Limerick in one semi-final, Clare against Kilkenny in the other semi-final in a couple of weeks' time. Delighted to welcome Kilkenny legend Eddie Brennan back to the show. Eddie, how are you getting on? Not too bad at all, and how's the form? You well? Yeah, very well. Uh, let's start with that Clare versus Wexford game, and I guess we can break this into two parts. The part where Clare looked mediocre, tired, I don't know how you want to describe it, and the part where they were absolutely sensational. So those first 57 minutes where they essentially lose those first 57 minutes by six points, why do you think that happened? I suppose they had a lot going on. The last fortnight, there was obviously the psychological hangover that was coming from losing the Munster final. And, you know, there was obviously a little bit of off-field stuff which was out of control to a degree. But um, that can that can just take the energy of the group a little bit. And when you combine all that with, you know, we have to give Wex for credit here, they came with a plan. They got their matchups right. I think there was so much they got right on the day. And, you know, it was, it was possibly the fact that at some stage, you know, Clare were never going to give up. I think that's one trait that is in this Clare team under Brian Lowen. Um, they struggled yesterday for large periods, but they just kept at it. And then, you know, and that's the mark of a good team that when the opportunities arise coming down the straight and, and they kind of have a little bit of a gap to go for, they went for it because, um, you know, and, and, and Wexford were game. I think they were absolutely brilliant. You know, maybe a, a decision, you know, for there was a potential for a, a, a penalty there. It could have swung the game. Wexford looked as if they were coming at, you know, they were they were in a commanding position, but... Um, Ultimately, like a loss of someone like Rory O'Connor is a big, big loss to someone like Wexford because uh, you need ha- all hands on deck. And I think even Dara said it himself afterwards. You know, they went right down into their squad because uh, it was it was a high octane match. There was there was a lot of uh, a lot of sore bodies, I'd imagine, afterwards. And just unfortunately, uh, they lost some of their key players who had done excellent jobs. And then you know you'd say the Shackens came off Tony Kelly and Shane O'Donnell towards the ends from the, the, the their markers and they suddenly came to life. When Brian Lohan looks back at the, the tape of those minutes where Claire struggled a little bit, when he looks at the O'Keefe as the sweeper with the, the, the man marking job that, that Shane Wreck did on, on Tony Kelly, what can he take from those instances and, and how he could potentially free his Claire forwards up a little bit better in the semi final? Yeah, they they probably have to look at just being able to to tweak their game you know, in the middle of a game, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, you know, it, it's to, to identify that straight away and and change it up. And look, it might be a little bit left field, but, you know, do you do you dump Tony Kelly in on the edge of the square? You know, is that something that counteracts what the opposition are doing? You know, because, uh, you know, you take even Devitt, you know, followed Ryan Taylor out the field and done a superb job on him. So sometimes um, we don't like to deviate. If you sit down and you make a plan, it's very difficult to to come away from that because of what the opposition are doing. And that's obviously the trick of of management and, and coaching. But it probably would be a brave thing to do. So it just has probably given Brian Lowen a little bit of food for toss that, you know, if someone, you know, even looking ahead, you know, is Mikey Butler potentially going to be the one to to tail, you know, Tony Kelly? So you just have to put an extra little bit of thought into that because generally Tony Kelly is well able to win his battles, you know, with, with guys he's marking, or he definitely can go to the 71st or 73rd minute. But, um, yeah, it'll just have given Brian a little bit of food for top. But I think the overriding thing for Clare is it was a relief. I felt this was the dangerous match for them. I think they were going to get met with huge energy from Wexford. And now they have a clear run. You know, they have no distractions. They can just solely focus on the learning semi-final, which is what I think was his overriding feeling afterwards and almost relief. Would it be a concern for Brian Lohan then the job that, Shane Wreck did on Tony Kelly and the impact it seemed to have on Clare overall, not just on on Tony Kelly and uh, the missed freeze from Tony Kelly. Maybe mentally it got to him as well. He wasn't having things his own way. But quite often when we're talking about man marking Tony Kelly as well, if you man mark Tony Kelly, it's going to free up other areas and it'll give the likes of Shane O'Donnell a bit more space and Peter Duggan to drop deep and be more influential. That didn't seem to happen either. By stopping Tony Kelly, it it almost seemed to curtail the entire Clare attacking performance. Yeah, they just. I I think the presence of D. O'Keefe and what D. O'Keefe didn't try to do was he didn't try to be everywhere. I think he just shut down a flank. Uh, he shut down the the kind of two flank for a while, and then he maybe switched to the far side in the second half because I think he, he had a little fumble that was obviously costly for Shanahan's point. So they were basically allowing you know a player to have one side of the defence, and after that the men were touched tight. 
But um, I think what, what, what probably helped, you know, is Clare got such an injection off their bench. You know, Mean came in, uh, Rogers came in, and sure, obviously Shanahar got one too. Like, and again, he's such a big abrasive fella, he's a handful. But yeah, Brian will definitely want to, to look at it from that point of view and say, look, how, how do we get Tony on the ball? Because obviously he's a key man. But I think the, the important point on there is you said they aren't a one-man band either. You know, I think Clare have a real strong squad and I think that's probably the key to them. And I think that's what will have pleased Brian is that they were able to go to their bench and spring a few lads. But um, definitely, look, it'll be a different challenge the next day against Kilkenny. So, so that spell between obviously the 57 minutes and, and the, the full-time whistle is what wins this. For Clare, you've mentioned somebody impact subs that won six without reply in an eight-minute spell, of course. I mean, you've got Shanahan contributing a huge amount of that. Did you see anything else? Did you see a tactical shift at all from, from either team that, that allowed the floodgates to open? Not really. I, I think it was just more energy levels. Like, Dio Keefe going off, then you'd say, look, was was that significant? Mm-hmm. Uh, wreck was, was you know, I suppose, to, to, to take the pun, really. He was wrecked at that stage. He just... He had put in such a shift following Tony Kelly around. Um, but I think, look, it's cruel to, to to mention these little bits and pieces, but I think if you look at the goalkeeping even yesterday, you know, Ivor Quilligan got away with a little bit of a mistake. You know, one, he didn't know whether to come and tack the ball and then it just, it, it floated through. But for Mark Fanning, you know, I, I'm certainly not going to criticise any goalkeepers because I I, I I was fired out of the goal when I was 14 and that was the end of my career in goal. It's just horrible to play in goal and, and I have such respect for goalkeepers. But, you know, you drop one ball that, you know, you can have the best game of your life and, you know, Mark Fanning dropped two yesterday. The second one came at a big price um, and especially when you have guys like Aaron Shannon he plays in around the square so much. And, and and it can be just so cruel, but um, and it was just literally a lapse in concentration. And I think you sometimes get that in championship matches. You sometimes get that when lads are tired and fatigue and everything, and and there's so much pressure on the line that just one little lapse, you know, in concentration. And we're talking about dropping off just two or three percent. I think Mark Fanning was probably going into mode of where am I going with this ball as soon as I catch it, and he just you know dropped it, and then he managed to scramble it because it almost got in, and then. You know, once it broke, it's just a lottery after that when there's bodies around the square. And that was a huge moment. Is that just a sense of occasion, Eddie, that got to a lot of those keepers at the weekends, you know, in, in a packed Thurless knockout? And like, is, is that the, the commonality between all the instances or is, was this just a, a freak afternoon, do you think? It could be a bit of a freak afternoon that, that they all seem to get a little dose of the, the apes, you know, save Ana Murphy. But um, it's, I don't know, it, I, I think it's just coincidental maybe but, you know, for them, the margins are so, so thin for a goalkeeper. Like, a, you know, even a cornerback can make a mistake and slip up once. Or, you know, midfielders can can miss a ball loads of times. But for goalkeepers, it's just such a, 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 a unique thing. They just, they, they just, it's such a fine line for them, you know, the width of a post, the width of a hurl, you know, the ball deflects off somebody else. You know, they're the margins, and you can't legislate for that. You can't, you can't plan for that. They're just one of these things that happen in a game of hurling where there's so many incidents that can have such an impact. And yeah, look, you can turn around and say, look, they're humans at the end of the day, and a human error sometimes. And look, you wouldn't be harsh on them. They're just part and parcel of the game, and it just was part of the story for me yesterday. Was that there were you know mistakes with goalkeepers that that turned out to be costly. When you talk about uh, humans and human error, you could imagine, I'd say, a few of the extra people pointed towards the, the human error that might have been made by the referee on, on Saturday afternoon as well. And the the lack of a penalty and black card in that instant laid on with Lee Chin. Uh, there was some talk in the Sunday game last night about referees trying to visualise a 25-metre line from the sideline and, and calls for a line to actually be painted on the pitch in future to try and help referees out. Uh, a, was it the, the wrong decision, in your opinion? And, and B, should referees be getting that extra help that that extra line painted on the pitch come the next round yeah I just I just I thought you know Liam articulated the argument very very well and made the point so well but I find it bizarre that officials would be instructed to imagine or to guess roughly where that 25 you know bring it in 25 metres if that's the rule bring it in paint it in and that's it it's clear it's it's black and white as such in terms of the area you have to be in that takes out some of the guesswork for referees, which I just hate. You just don't ever go there with guesswork. 
But then, you know, the incident itself, I just think when a defender makes no attempt whatsoever to tackle a guy and just literally wrapped him up like he did, that is the reason it was brought in because um, he knows the consequences of, you know, maybe trying to go honest here and see can I hook or dispossess Lee Chin in that situation. He knows that he's the one at the disadvantage. So therefore, you have to reward the attacker. Uh, and again... Look, we'll say there was. I felt there was a similar incident in the in the Leinster final as well. And you know, you'd be just question: Have they just completely forgotten about the black book? Because I thought, when people know, when defenders or any player knows, this is the consequences of my action, and they roll the dice, then they can't have any arguments. And I think Wexford people are quite rightly grieved on that yesterday. And that's look. I'm not trying to take away from 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 Claire. Claire went and won that match when they had to. But at that point in time, it was it was a huge moment, and and I think definitely uh, I can understand where they're going with it. But I would just like if if you're going to put a rule in place, be as definitive or as as clear as you can with it. And I also again I will echo a point that I've made for a number of years. Would it not be handy for the referee for part of the wire to have somebody there say, "Can you just check that for me? It'll only take thirty seconds." Did the defender make any form of an effort? And yes, there was two cover and clear lads on the way back. But when Lee Chin got possession of that ball, he was in that zone and there was only one thing on his mind. And I think it was the wrong call in hindsight. I think Wexford probably should have had a penalty. Maybe I'm being biased to the forwards from my my old days. Well, it's more it's more the greater issue of like referees yeah. have sort of been hung out to dry here. Like you wouldn't in any other sport say, well, you know, in football, uh, we're not going to put in a line for the penalty box. You can sort of figure it out yourself and guess yeah. and imagine. You you know, we all know where the 18-yard box is. Like, it's a very fine margin. And, like, these are huge games that, you know, the referee needs to know exactly how many metres something is because the difference between a penalty and a free is literally the difference between a place in an All-Ireland quarterfinal or an All-Ireland yeah. semi-final. Like, the, having someone in the air, the referee, the VAR in hurling, like, yeah. like, of any sport, it feels like. <laughs> of any sport, it feels like you know. 40 stoppages. Yeah, I I know, I, I suppose I, I've heard that point made, but I just still think if, like, we're not going to be using it all the time, but I think if the referee wants an extra little bit of information or an extra bit of clarity on something like that, I mean, we're trying to support them. Like you said, they're, I agree wholeheartedly. They are, they're, the pressure on them is 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 outrageous. Like, and, and again, you know, turn around and point the finger at them for a team costing the season. That's not right, and we don't want that. But I think the referees board or whoever it is should be trying to put in, you know, supports and be as clear and as definitive as they can on these things with the overall view of protecting referees and saying, listen, we want to take the heat out of them in, in relation to being a lonely figure having to make that call. And I think they're brave in that they'll, they'll make those calls. But I do think if there's scope there for that capacity, just just to check it, if he wants to check it, because you could see Lee Chin point, you know, making the argument with him, you know, afterwards. And I don't know what that conversation was. I'd only imagine he was probably saying to him, "I was inside an, you know, inside an area. Do players even know there's a 25 meter area? I, you know, I don't know. So, um, but I think if, like you said, there, on, you have to be definitive. You have to be clear. There's no guesswork at all and and I just found it a very unusual thing that officials will be given that type of instruction it just seems a little bit out there Would the umpire on the left hand side not have had the best view of the whole thing? Yeah he possibly should have been the one to, to maybe make that call or, or have those conversations and look we, we're, we're saying that now in hindsight um, I don't know um, and again it just maybe you know that teamwork that goes on between a ref and his officials and it's even for, you know, for Pod Dwyer to just take a second there and be able to go talk to, to his officials or whatever. I don't know. Uh, that would seem, you know, best practice. Um, but look, uh, in, in the heat at the moment there, um, you know, is one voice better than two? Is, is three heads better than one? You know, in, in terms of decision making there and maybe what they can feed in. But yes, you would imagine in ideally the, the umpire should be very proactive there and, and, and help the referee with that decision. Just to finish up on the Clare game, if I can get you to put your Kilkenny hat on for a moment, are you more <laughs> nervous that that Clare actually won that game as opposed to say the, I guess the, the muscle memory of of playing Wexford in an All Ireland semi final? Yeah, I, I I wasn't sure because I think Kilkenny in the last number of years have been struggling with Wexford. They, they you know and and mm -hmm. this Wexford group are very 
uh, confident in taking Uncle Kenny. They, en- they enjoy taking Uncle Kenny and they're not afraid of Kill Kenny. So equally, I suppose one or the other wasn't uh, any better, really. But yeah, I do. I, I'd be nervous as a, as a Kilkenny person. I think this, this is a big challenge because, you know, Clare have sole focus now on Kilkenny. Uh, Croke Park is a place that I think will definitely suit their, their, their game. I think they have guys that will relish the chance to run around Croke Park. I think it was maybe 2018 when they had that epic semi-final against Galway. You know, Peter Duggan, Tony Kelly and these guys. So uh, they will look forward to this. And I think they have a lot of young lads that will be chomping at the bit now and like they have a, like I said they have a clear runway now so I think they have they have guys that can hurt Kilkenny but equally I think uh, you know the, these are the kind of matches that that a Brian Cody team you know any team prepared by Brian Cody and they love this occasion and I think it's 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 a glorious opportunity uh, Kilkenny won't fear Clare either It's going to be Galway against Limerick in the other semi-final Galway got the, the better of Cork in today's first game on Saturday Cork with a load of regrets after that the 12 wides by half time is the, the really stark statistic uh, just to, to touch on Galway first before we get into to Cork as a corner forward looking at that Galway full back line how horrific would they be to, to play against first of all? Yeah they're, they're, they're a good Jonas um, I, I'd probably take my chances on, on Grealish or Morrissey I, I don't know what I like to go in wrestling with Dahi for, <laughs> for, for 70 minutes um, he's, he's a hardy route so he is and uh, he just I, I, you just have to admire him but I think as a unit they're really good like Grealish went off out the fields you know tracking you know and, and I thought done really well found himself in really good positions yeah he had the long range goal which was you know a little bit of a, a fluke really but he also found himself high up the field for opportunities there where he could have, you know, impacted the match even more. But, um, yeah, as a unit, I think they work so well. And it's obviously dependent on then where Parik Mannion sits in that. I thought Parik Mannion played really well yesterday. But that axis of Dahi Bork Mannion and even David Bork yesterday, I thought, was, was really important uh, for Galway. But they set the tone early, I think. While Cork probably will definitely rue the missed opportunities and kind of left Galway in that match, I still think Galway looked like they wanted it a little bit more. Um, I just thought their, I, I thought their body language, I thought even their endeavour, like they, they just scrapped for absolutely everything. And I just thought, you know, with the with the opportunities Cork missed, like even there was two, maybe even there was two guilt edged goal opportunities there in the first half that Fitzgibbon missed, Alan Connolly missed. And then, you know, you had Robbie O'Flynn coming through with a half one that you just have to be so cold and ruthless with those. And uh, they they come at a huge price for Cork today. It felt like with a couple of those goal opportunities as well, they gave the, the Galway keeper a, a decent chance to save them, even though they were obviously good saves uh, in all the occasions. Like, the, as I say, that, that 12 wides by half time at a, at a point then when they bring Patrick Horgan on is something that may sting a few Cork supporters. Like, I guess the two questions are, was halftime too late to bring Patrick Horgan on? And I guess, should he have been in the team from the first place? Yeah, sure, look, <laughs> now it looks like it was an awful mistake, you mm-hmm. know, because we sit up this morning and that's just, uh, you know, Kieran Kingston makes those decisions. That's what a manager does. And, and he probably had good reason for that. But... Um, I still think, look, I, I, to be fair, look, Lehan had been going well. I think he'd been hitting his freeze fairly well. But look, just my view would have been that, look, I still think Patrick Horgan fully focused. And look, the, the Cork management are the only ones that, that know that they see him night in, night out. And while he has been exceptional over the last decade or more, I still think, you know, you, you judge a guy on how he's going and training. And, and that's obviously been the reason for that. But look, when you look at the frees that were missed there yesterday, you, you definitely say that those frees are ones that that Hoggy would would generally would generally nail. So um, was it a case of you know it was too late maybe when they brought him on? I don't think so. I still think Cork had ample opportunities. You know even the two that broke down off the post. I mean there was no Cork attacker you know taking that chance. They were just a fraction slow to react. You know to those chances and. Those are, you know, opportunities that, you know, yeah, an inside forward has to hang around for and make a nuisance to yourself. And you look at the opposite, like with with the likes of Conor Whelan, like he he's just so dangerous and he's so game for a physical challenge as well. 
You mentioned in the Irish Independent this morning that Cork are catfishing their fans at the moment. <laughs> do, you, do you think the real Cork will stand up over the next little while? And and where will that get them? Like this generation of, of young hurlers that are coming through, my sense is that they are potential All-Ireland winners. Is that just because they're they're from Cork, I'm thinking that, and, and maybe I'm overrating them a little bit? Uh, no, I, I, I do. I think there's, there's, there's definitely a group of lads there, but I just think, look... <sighs> Desire to me seems to, is a big word. Like, and you say, how much do they really, really want it? You know, because I just thought yesterday, Galway looked like they wanted it a little bit more. And you'd say maybe they, they, they won it because of Cork's, you know, inability to convert their chances, but they still got over the line. And I think in Joyce, they have a brilliant center back. I, I, I felt all year, I think it has been probably changed their season a little bit by putting them in there and putting Coleman on the wing. But I just think there's, there's probably not enough, still not enough steel. I think that, that area of, of being able to go in there and, and get hurt, I mean, they, they have all the skills in the world. And if you wanted to go watch an exhibition match in the morning, that's probably, you know, they, they have all the skills. There's some brilliant players there. But, you know, they just need a few guys to, they, they need to really get that the bit between their teeth. And I, I just, you know, uh, maybe I'm just living in the past a tiny bit here, but... I look at the car teams that we played against and by God, they had steel, you know, they had a, they, they were able to get a job done and, and that's the trick. It's, it's, it's maybe it's a psychological thing, but I think in Joyce and guys like Robbie O'Flynn, Alan Connolly, I think they definitely have, you know, guys that are, that are well good enough. Uh, what I love about Joyce is he, he's for a nine, a, 20, a guy to show you of his 20th birthday, he is physically, you know, stuck into everything. He's able to catch high ball, which is, again, something that we don't really associate with our centre-backs modern day. You know, he's he's really strong in the air and just does the simple things so well. But, yeah, Cork have, they've, they've worked to do, but they definitely have the ingredients there. But, uh, like I said there, I think the, the defensive unit needs to still, still the, the full-back position still presents a, a big challenge. That steeliness issue is probably key then for Cork progressing and whether it's a psychological thing or whether it's just a physical thing that they're simply not spending enough time in the gym and simply aren't getting to the level that Limerick are. And I know some of the conversations we've had on the show over the past six weeks about Cork is that they aren't at it physically, that they maybe just simply aren't putting the same effort in that some of the other counties are to bulk themselves up. Uh, if it is that, like that's just a new coach coming in, a new backroom team and sorting that out. And like if the skill level is there, like this and the underage success is there, like this is a pretty attractive job if Kieran Kingston does decide to go. Yeah, it is. It's a, it does. It holds huge appeal. And, and, and if, you know, hypothetically, if Kieran Kingston were to go, I don't know, like, I, I think maybe is Ben O'Connor the one that, that looks to be best positions to step in there, Nate? And I'm not sure. But, um, yeah, I, 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 I'm I not sure it's just solely the physical conditioning. I mean, I think a lot of these are young guys. And, and last year in the all Ireland final, it definitely looked like physical conditioning, you know, went against them. But I also think it's mindset as much as anything else. Like, I mean, I think... Uh, you know, if you look at some of the, you know, over the years, like, you know, some of the best hurlers weren't the, the biggest, you know, um, it, it's it's not so much the size of the dog, really. It's it's the size of the fight, I think. And, and there's a bit of, there's a bit of both there. But I just think, you know, in the example I, I looked at, you know, in, yesterday was, you know, a couple of times they worked the ball away from contact and they went over and back in front of the goal and then down the wing. And it looked lovely. I mean, if Mark Coleman had to put that ball over the bar, you're going, wow, that's that's an incredible score. But it still took, you know, energy, six or seven passes out from their own defence, and then it went wide. And straight from the puck out, Galway, you know, hit David Bourke, they hit their forward, and the ball was over the bar. And sometimes, look, I think there was an article done there last week on Cork's efficiency. You know, th- that's what probably ultimately bit them in the arse yesterday. Like, they just weren't efficient. They didn't convert. And... uh they have to tidy that up. And I think that's that's mindset as much as anything else. Like even Dara Fitzgibbon going in with that goal, like, I mean, you expect someone of his calibre to just hang that ball up in the net. Like, I mean, he needed to take maybe another, and, and I'm talking hindsight and, and that's great. You know, I wasn't there at that moment in time, but I think when you get in on those opportunities and you're bearing down a goal inside the 14, that ball has to be put away from the goalkeeper. You just pl- place it along the ground or pass it into one of the corners and and he just made a he made a, I think Anna Murphy is possibly going to jump into the All Star uh, driving seat with with the saves yesterday. 
Uh, we had Sarah O'Donovan on the show on Thursday night, a former All-Ireland winner with Cork. I'm having that moment where I can't remember whether she said this on air or off air, so I'm going to screw her either way and say, you know what, we're going to put this out there. She said, I'd love to see Eddie Brennan uh, go in at Cork. <laughs> what are the chances? <laughs> no, I'd say my, my only connection was I was born in Cork, but oh, but oh. And, and, uh, oh well, so the there was a li- yeah, yeah, but uh, no, I don't think... I don't think I'd, I'd make customs at the moment now. <laughs> but um, yeah, look, Jesus, as a coach, looking in from the outside, you would definitely say the raw materials are there. Um, and, and I would have felt, look, someone I thought, did, like Dermot O'Sullivan being in there, I thought, here's a guy who knows how to anchor a defence and how's to, how to... And I'm not saying for a second, you know, did, did he fail him or whatever else it is, but I just felt, you know, if, if you're young guys and you're in there as, as, as Cork guys looking up to someone who, who put it all on the line for Cork, you know, you'd surely be inspired by a guy like him. But I do think there's, 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 there's good lads down there. Um, I think, you know, should Kieran Kingston step away? Um, I personally feel looking in from the outside that, that, that Ben O'Connor has done a good bit of work coaching down there. You know, is it is it someone like his time to maybe marry that because I thought he had that running, you know, skillful game, you know, himself and Jerry, that that kind of, you know, you recall how effective that was. But equally, Ben O'Connor was a tough competitor and he wasn't afraid to get stuck in either. So maybe, you know, maybe a fresh voice, maybe new ideas is is potentially what's what's needed down there now. But uh, I still think it was very brave of Kieran Kingston to go back in a second time. I think that's not an easy decision to make. Hypothetically speaking, what are the best ma- jobs out there for uh, a young hurling manager <laughs> <laughs> you can ask Tommy this as well or a few others um, yeah it's, look I, I I would always look at every setup. I think you look in from the outside and you just go is there guys in there you'd like to work with I mean you know you look at at, at what Limerick are doing at the moment Claire there's, there's so many attractive propositions I think to be fair, too, I, I equally think, you know, and, I, and I've spoke, spoken a bit tongue-in-cheek about even the Tipperary job. Like, I mean, I still think that if you're an aspiring Tipperary manager who believes you can do it, I think there's a good, there's a decent crew of lads to put a two- or three-year project together. So, um, but yeah, look, uh, that car group, I think there's a forward unit there. And I think, yeah, w- would you like to, would you like to think, we'd all like to think that you would do, you know, a really good job Definitely, the ingredients are there. I think for from a forward perspective, but I think look, Cork's issue is probably just consolidating the defence more so. Uh, would I like to work with them? You, you would if I was from Cork. <laughs> you were born there. You, you just uh, you, you never said that when you were playing for Kilkenny, did you? <laughs> I'm not from Cork. I was born in Cork. Yeah, it's a difference, yeah, yeah. And it's a, <laughs> passing through. We got to stop doing this in the Monday morning. We we're trying to get Anthony Moyles the me job last week. We we're doing ourselves out of our best pundits. That's it. Yeah, if we were. Uh, <laughs> We are agents. I don't fall into that category, lads. Um, very quickly, Eddie, who's going to be playing in the All Ireland hurling final this year? Um, I said kind of after the Munster final, I wouldn't be shocked if we get a repeat of that, and, and I won't be either. But I still think, um, I still think. Look, I, I maybe being a, a small bit uh, biased here, but I do think Kenny will, will will prevail there. I think they have a lot of work to do. I think they have a lot of questions that need to be answered. If they are to beat that Clare team, they're going to have to pull out a hell of a performance. Um, but um, I think they will be facing whoever gets through there. It will be Limerick in the final. I, I, I think Galway will throw it down to them. Um, but I, I, I still think they, they probably haven't enough David Burks to go around. I think they have some good players. But like when you see someone like him, that is, as, and I rate him really, really highly. But he came in there yesterday, and I think you know, with with five or six minutes to go, maybe he came off. But he, I could see Henry checking with him. Was he okay to stay going? And I just think with with what Limerick bring in energy, I just think they mightn't have enough of him to go around. And I think maybe for large periods they'll they'll keep it pucked out to him. And I think with 15, 12, 15 minutes to go, I would imagine Limerick. I'd expect Limerick to kick home and win by a couple of you know six seven points. But Hurland's a funny game. You just don't know. Um, but it, it's it's hard to see. You know. Them, them stopping Limerick getting to that final uh, Eddie um, uh, just before we, we let you go um, just awful news over the weekend around Tyrone GEA and Damien Casey who tragically passed away at the age of 29 obviously a, a name that a lot of people would have been very familiar with despite not having seen a, a whole pile of him play I mean for somebody to kind of exceed in a county that's not one of the traditional 
powerhouses of hurling was was quite something. Um, just awful news over the weekend. Yeah, just shocking news. And again, I, I suppose my my own knowledge of it is just the story that has transpired over the weekend, which is just heartbreaking, really, because um, you know, for his family and his teammates, you know, from my reading of it, it would appear that he was a hugely popular guy, very well got in in, in Tyrone hurling circles, and it's just a, an awful tragedy. And your and your thoughts will go out to his teammates, the community, and and his family. Eddie Brennan, great stuff this morning. Thanks, Millie, for being with us. No bother, lads. Take care. Uh, Eddie Brennan there on the line. Um,